And um, thanks again to the Policy Institute for being really a remarkably um, effective partner for my center. So I wear a lot of hats around this university, as some of you know. So I'm on the faculty board for the Policy Institute, but then I'm also the director of the Center for the Environment. But today I'm really going to speak more in that role as director of the C4E, as Dennis called it, as we affectionately refer to it. Um, which I think really has, and, and really I want to say this actually on behalf of more than just my center, and that will be clear on my second slide, the, the centers in Discovery Park, and I see Candace here, right, have been, I think that partnership between the Policy Institute and Discovery Park, I really think of those two institutions as being the two primary gateways between Purdue and the rest of the world, and many of us on this campus think that those are really important um, institutions to have. Each has its own strengths, and so together they can really be actually, I think, a very effective complements in terms of bringing the university and partnering the university with the rest of um, um, our community, right? And that's both the state, locally, uh, nationally, and internationally. So I'll say a little bit more about that um, during the course of my talk. So again, I'm the director of the Center for the Environment, so that's where our offices are located. We do not get to enjoy that entire beautiful building. Our offices are pretty much right there. So don't think that we have um, our own wonderful space. I just want to be very clear. There's lots of good people in that building, but it's still a very nice space um, on the west side of campus. Uh, and I'm a professor of political science uh, who's been at Purdue now for 10 or 11 years, uh, which is partly how I also got interested in the Policy Institute. So the first thing I have to say when I talk about the center is that the center is a part of this very substantial, really, institution of centers called Discovery Park, Purdue. Um, Discovery Park was created about 10 years ago, around the same time that I came here. It's actually a whole set of facilities, including quite a number of other very nice buildings, um, some of which house some fairly substantial laboratory and other kinds of research equipment, the Burke Nanotechnology Center, the Binley Bioscience Center, et cetera, et cetera. We have a hall for discovery and learning research. Um, and so forth and so on. So the Center for the Environment is just one piece, right, of this much larger institution um, in Discovery Park. All of these centers, however, are designed to, in, on the one hand, be a sort of interdisciplinary home, a place where Purdue researchers can connect across their departments and colleges more easily. Um, and then also a place, again, as I said in my opening remarks, where we can partner those researchers, right, with all of the various stakeholders in our wider community. That's clearly industry, so a big part of what Discovery Park does is build partnerships with industry, and so commercialization is a big part of what happens at Discovery Park. But I think Discovery Park is much more than that, and thanks to people like Candace and Al Rebar and others who have really been able to see that this is actually an opportunity to also connect to government, to the public, and not just to industry, right? And so in that sense, that's where Discovery Park has been able to be an even stronger sort of partner for institutions like GPRI. Oh, so my thing is doing that thing again. It's doing that automatic advance sort of, I got to change that. That's not going to work, right? So um, <laughs> use timings. No, no, no. No using timings, right? I, yeah, exactly. I did, that, I did that once, and I didn't know what the heck was going on, and I realized it was a great way to keep yourself on time, but I, I'm, not, I'm not actually going to do that today. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. I'm done. Yeah, that would be great. Actually, I am almost done with this slide, but I, I do want to say just quickly, so there are actually almost a half a dozen centers all focused on this issue of sustainability within Discovery Park. So the Center for the Environment is just one of those. So we have sister centers who also have been very important in terms of working with GPRI, the Climate Change Research Center, the Center for Global Food Security that you probably heard about today, um, and, and, and uh, also the Energy Center. So there's a lot of different activity that overlaps around this idea of sustainability. Um, and the Center for the Environment is just a part of that. So what we really do at the Center for the Environment is try to promote proactive, interdisciplinary research and learning and engagement, right, about, and then this part, I think, is something we've stressed a lot, especially in the last year since I became the director, specifically really focused on important environmental challenges. So there's a tremendous amount of environmental research happening at Purdue. Depending on how you want to count, you could probably say there are upwards of a couple hundred of people at Purdue who do research related to the environment. So one of the things that the Center for the Environment is trying to do is identify a few big problems, right, big challenges that we can help those faculty have a real impact on, right? And so that's something why a center like um, the Center for the Environment exists is really to help those faculty 
be proactive and interdisciplinary in, in addressing a few of those important environmental challenges. So there are three words that I use to try to describe the things that the center can do for those faculty in our community. So one is connections. It's a big university. There are like 2,000 faculty here, 40,000 students, and quite a few administrators. So even somebody like me, who's been working in this area for 11 years, still meets people who are working on environmental problems on this campus that I didn't know were here. So one of the things that we do as a center is hopefully between me and my faculty advisory board and also Rose Philly, my managing director, who has an almost astonishing encyclopedic knowledge of all of the different faculty working in these different environmental areas on campus, is we can help faculty find the people that they want to work with on a given problem, right? Um, and so that's an important thing on a campus like this. We also really are about impact. So one of the things that a center like ours is trying to do in a place like Discovery Park is not only help people do good research, because of course that's the first thing that has to happen, but the faculty are pretty good at that. What we're really here to do is help them have as much impact as possible with that research. So that means in some ways promoting that research and, and bringing it to outside stakeholders, right, in ways that I'll talk about a little bit later in my discussion. Um, and it also means raising just sort of public awareness about that work, right? So an important thing that we're really trying to do is get some of that research out of the ivory tower, right, and bring it to the larger community and really increase the impact in that way. And then finally, we're here to really support our faculty. We only exist because we are trying to help the faculty do the things that they need to do. So like a lot of other centers on campus, anything that we can do, right, within our limited resources to help the faculty um, be more effective in their work, write a better proposal, promote that proposal more effectively, so forth and so on. Support is the other thing that we really um, are here to work on, including especially in this day and age where, for example, the National Science Foundation has just voted not to fund my discipline anymore. Uh, we really have to be more and more creative about uh, finding other places for people to fund research in this area, right? So that's something <laughs> I should talk to Arden about sometime. But anyway, not his fault. I know it's not his fault. But, um, no, I haven't seen it, actually. I should look at that. No, that, yeah, actually, this is not really a laughing matter. You have to laugh, because otherwise you would cry. But, um, so just briefly, um, I talked about environmental challenges, right? So here are just a few of the things that we are currently really working on in the Center for the Environment, where our faculty really are um, having an impact. I'll, I'll highlight all of these briefly. But you can see just from this initial slide that there's a tremendous amount of diversity, right? From fairly traditional environmental research in the area of contaminants and air and water quality to more innovative activity around this idea of soundscapes, which I'll say a little bit more about, and then to actually some work more on the engineering side, which I'll talk about as well um, as a couple of our final focus areas. Um, so we're really trying to be as, as, as broad across campus as possible. So here's Chad Jaffert, one of our faculty members, um, working on the fate and transport of synthetic and, and compounds right through the environment. Uh, we have quite a few faculty who are really leading world experts in this, especially in the areas of soil and water um, transport of compounds. Uh, also people working on bioaccumulation, the, the concentration of some of these compounds in uh, living organisms. And then also toxicity and remediation. So one of our faculty, Jennifer Freeman, was just actually in the, in the press recently about her work with zebrafish, looking at endocrine disruptors, right, and the possible impacts on, um, I think it was neurological sort of effects of those compounds. So one of the nice things about Purdue that's exciting is that we actually have people working in all three of these areas, which is not always that typical, right? So many campuses will be very good at one or the other of these sort of aspects of this kind of problem of environmental contaminants. But we really have people working in all three, which I think situates us very nicely to make a real contribution there. We have tremendous strength in the sort of traditional areas of air and water quality. So here's Professor Paul Shepson, head of chemistry, former head of the Climate Center, who's also a pilot, and his Airborne Laboratory for Atmospheric Research, which is basically a fancy word for his plane that has a lot of scientific equipment on it to measure air pollution and fluxes in the atmosphere. So Paul has done some extremely interesting work, both related to climate change, but also most recently related to actually hydraulic fracturing and measuring methane and other releases over those drill pads in places like Pennsylvania and North Dakota. He gave a fascinating talk on that topic to our seminar a couple of months ago. Uh, and then a very strong group working on water pollution, especially as you might imagine, a place like Purdue. A lot of work on non-point source water pollution problems, right, especially from agriculture. Uh, also really in the areas of both measuring, reducing, 
and then even modeling, right, what kinds of management effects will have different sorts of impacts, right, on that water pollution. Um, real expertise in terms of also shifting towards biofuels, right, in terms of crop production and what kinds of impacts that might have on water availability and also on water quality. And then also um, we have a pretty strong group working on hydrology and especially the hydrological impacts of land use changes, right? And then also as we look at a changing climate, what that's likely to do to local hydrology in a number of different ecosystems. Um, pretty strong group working on biodiversity and the conservation of uh, essentially endangered species and, and also uh, ecosystem services. One thing that's a bit distinctive about our group is that there's a real interest in particular in this issue in what we call a managed landscape. So how do you deal with these problems which are difficult enough in a relatively pristine sort of area like a national park or what have you, but how do you deal with these same challenges in a place like Indiana or many other parts of the world including Brazil and others where you have very intensive agriculture living side by side with people, side by side with protected areas, right? So this is something that we've done some work in and we're really looking to actually have a bigger impact in in the next few years. We're trying to organize some more effort in this area. Uh, soundscape ecology is a very new idea in the area of environmental research. It's really looking at the role of sound in ecosystem functioning and also the threats to natural soundscapes, as Brian Pijanowski, who's pictured here, talks about them. There are increasingly few places in the world today where you don't basically hear people or our impacts, right? This is a very widespread but very poorly understood environmental impact. One that also inspires a great deal of controversy in terms of the management of recreation areas. So for example, one of Brian's students is writing a PhD thesis on how the Park Service is trying to deal with conflicts over noise, right? So snowmobiling or overflights in the Grand Canyon and what have you, right? And how do we even begin to manage that kind of an issue? So this is a really exciting um, area that is being led by Brian that we're hoping to have a big impact in. And then finally, just a couple of engineering issues that I'll just talk about very briefly. There's a very exciting and very um, substantial group working in this area of sustainable electronics. So these are mostly engineers, but also people from Cranert and other departments, including the College of Liberal Arts, Anthropology, and Political Science, who are trying to understand and then reduce the impact of all of these electronic things that we use for an average of two years now that are filled with things like rare earths and precious metals and all kinds of other stuff and then we throw them out and so this is actually an unprecedented environmental challenge and so again led by Carol Handworker in materials engineering and a whole very large group of other individuals we have actually an NSF Iger grant which is a, again some of you may or may not be familiar with that term so a, an, an interdisciplinary graduate training grant so we have 10 new graduate students starting at Purdue just this year across multiple departments who are working on the different sort of overlapping circles, right? Environmental, social, and economic sustainability perspectives on this problem of how to minimize the impact of electronic production and disposal and recycling. And then finally, uh, the last area that I'll just mention briefly is a, is a very new partnership that just started this year. This is really um, started as, as a Purdue cluster hire initiative between the College of Engineering and the College of Liberal Arts. So the theme is building sustainable communities. So it overlaps a lot with what Carol's group is talking about, but, but the, really the perspective is much broader. The, the idea is that we're really living in a world where, again, to go back to some of the other things that I talked about earlier in, 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 in my discussion, humans are having increasingly substantial and complicated and therefore unpredictable effects on the environment. So we really need to be thinking in a much more complicated and sophisticated way about how do we make those human natural systems more resilient in the face of change? How do we understand the role of our own decision-making institutions, both formal and informal, on the resiliency of those systems? And how do we also understand network effects, right? And how do our, for example, critical infrastructures in these societies respond to the effects of a breakdown in some other infrastructure system, right? Or some other unexpected breakdown. So you can see, I hope, in those quick few little bullet points, the attempt to really synthesize, right? Important ideas from the engineering perspective with those from the social sciences, really in the pursuit of making natural human communities more resilient, right, more sustainable going forward. And we're going to actually hire seven new faculty in this area over the next two years. 
and we already have some people working as well on thinking about projects and proposals, right, to, to try to build on strength in this area. Okay. So then let me just close by saying a few words about the impact part, since that's what this audience might be most interested in. So maybe not surprisingly, um, when I took over the center last year as director, after several years working with the Climate Center as an associate director, I was very interested in even increasing the ability of the center to help have Purdue's science in this area be delivered to decision makers. And this was a natural area to really be connecting to the Policy Institute, right? So um, to date, we've managed to sponsor a couple of workshops which uh, one of which we did in partnership with, the, with GPRI, which I'll just talk about in a slide in a minute. We also are intending to work on policy briefs, much like the ones that GPRI also offers. And again, Angela and Dennis and I have worked for years now in a variety of settings on policy briefs through the Climate Center and others. So there's already a well-established mechanism for partnering in this way. And I, and I think this is something that we're likely to continue to do going forward in, in ways that I think will be really very fruitful. Um, so just as one example, on March 6th of this year, so just slightly over a month ago, uh, just after a horrendous snowstorm, we still managed to have a workshop in Indianapolis at the government office building um, for about 50 people on the issue of nutrient management. So how do you best deal with the problem, or at least the potential problem, of runoff from farm operations, right, and the water pollution problems that that can cause. Um, we had more than 50 people in the room. We had, thanks to the effort of Angela and other people at the Policy Institute, as well as others at Purdue, four members of the state legislature in attendance, which was great. On a, people who, um, uh, it's very hard to get them to be in attendance for this sort of thing. Uh, many state agency people. And then also uh, individuals from producer organizations. So we had interest group folks there as well. And then also environmental groups, right? So a pretty wide diversity of, of people who were there for this two hour event. For uh, presenters, that's uh, my friend and colleague, Professor Linda Prokopi, talking about uh, the social science aspect of this problem. But we also had two more technical presentations on different sort of technologies for reducing runoff. And then one presentation on the role of modeling as a way of trying to help understand these different policy options. Again. Very nonpartisan, not advocating any particular solution, really just trying to help people who are struggling with these problems every day understand the latest thinking and, and research on everything from why do farmers do what they do to how does a two-stage ditch re reduce the amount of nitrogen that ends up in a waterway, right? So, um, and again, this was a, 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 an event that we actually also initiated, again, in part based on a meeting that was originally organized by GPRI, in partnership with the University of Notre Dame, so one of their presenters was also involved in this, the State Department of Agriculture, and of course, um, the Policy Institute. So this was a really, I think, by all accounts, a very successful event, um, well attended, uh, and people seem to get, get a lot out of it. So um, the other event that I'll close with is actually happening tomorrow. Uh, we're not actually co-sponsoring this with the Policy Institute, although we certainly could be. Uh, this is a panel that is gonna be happening on campus, which is something we've done more of in the past, right? And it's really dedicated to this issue of, again, unconventional natural gas exploration or hydraulic fracturing. So this program we have co-sponsored with an interdisciplinary graduate education group on campus, the Ecological Sciences and Engineering Program at Purdue, a truly outstanding group of interdisciplinary environmental graduate students who organize a symposium along these lines every year. And really, when they were interested in this issue, and so were we, they approached us and we agreed to go ahead and organize this event together. So this will bring, um, I think it'll be five faculty, or actually not all faculty, or other experts onto a panel tomorrow night um, speaking about this issue, including actually Professor Wally Tyner, who is a, another member of the um, faculty leadership board for GIPRI, and then some other outside experts as well talking about this. And again, the goal really being, and the students to their credit, have been the most um, insistent on this point, that this be a, a the, the phrase they used at a pre-event was an advocacy-free zone, right? So they really were very, very, very insistent on this, right? They, they really just want to get as many of the sort of facts out there as they can about even these, these extremely controversial issues, right, like this one. So, so that's just two examples in the last year of the kinds of events that we're trying to organize. I really see a bright future in organizing a lot more of them going forward, including hopefully things in Washington and not just in Indianapolis. And I, I see 
the Policy Institute being a really important partner in a lot of that work. So with that, I'll stop and open it up to your questions. Yeah. Thank you. I was asked to, there was a group, it was a bridging group between uh, government and industry. It was called the Institute for Resource Management that was sponsored by Robert Redford. He huh? started that, and so I was asked to speak. I'm no Robert Redford, I'll say that. Yeah, yeah. I know. And so I went out there, and it got to spend a week in Sundance and stayed, yeah. <laughs> stayed in the actors' homes there, which was nice. nice. But, but this was, uh, he had brought the uh, U.S. Forest Service, asked him, mm -hmm to, they were going to have their senior policy planning meeting, and they wanted to bring people, and that time I was industry, to come in and talk about the, how, from a resource planning standpoint, and, and looking at energy minerals and things like this, uh, what would be, how do you set a national strategy, a policy of how they manage those that for the United States, and then working with industry so it's kind of a win-win thing, and right. I, I was just curious if, uh, does that organization still exist? Huh. And, it, and it seems like it, there's some um, synergism to what you're describing and where you'd want to go and might be an opportunity to collaborate. So I don't know if that organization still exists or not. Uh, so that's a good question. Um, certainly there are many similar organizations. So my colleague, Professor McCann, Maureen McCann and I went to a meeting in November or October, I guess, of numerous of these sort of interdisciplinary energy and environment centers from campuses all across the country. Um, so Michigan, Berkeley, lots of different universities, right? It was at Northwestern. So we saw, right, all of these different universities and the different ways that they've tried to structure this kind of effort. And it was interesting and illuminating to see how they were doing it, right? Um, so there are, there are many similar kinds of institutions out there. Um, now, that was mostly universities, right? So whether this kind of group exists, I don't know. But one of the things that really struck me, I will say this, at that meeting, and this is, I think, where the Discovery Park connection is really helpful, is the most effective of these centers actually were very strong partners with at least some industries, right? So they had clearly reached out and built a relationship that wasn't just delivering science to people in one direction, but was also really in dialogue with industry and even government, right, about what challenges they were facing and how we could work together, right, on solving some of those problems. Well, I was going to say that uh, what I did was I brought some of the national laboratory people. In that right. time, they were very active uh, with uh, global climate models. There right. were five of them back in those days, right. each competing on the physics and the science right. that's set within those. Uh, Colorado State, uh, NCAR, National Center for Atmospheric yep. Research, all of these people. It was a forum to understand so that not just, but it was really looking at the policies, but also what could we do as industry and as government to sponsor research in so we could get to the facts what what what's the best optimum way uh, of managing the resources in a sustainable way yep so that I think you're you, in, but you also have the value of Purdue of having this great depth and breadth of engineers and yes scientists everybody as you point out here so you have a lot of the capability in-house but as much as you could bring outside then it that's good too uh, but and crucial yeah and again I I really see centers like mine, or ours, and then again institutions like GPRI as, as both being just crucial, right, to that. But that, again, that being a connection, right, between the outside world, for lack of a better term, partners, right, industry and government and others, that, that's crucial. That, that's, to solve a lot of these problems, to make progress, you have to have that. So well, it was also an issue in rulemaking for the EPA, right. so that you had science-based rulemaking, and that's where policy also has to come into that, so it, it feeds right. well. Yep, thanks. I was just going to make a couple comments. Um, I, 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 I'm particularly interested in what you're doing tomorrow on, on hydraulic fracturing as, a, as an issue that's kind of near and dear to my heart uh, coming out of the energy area. But the one thing I want to just kind of compliment you on, or maybe your students, is I think this notion of having an advocacy-free zone where you can get a set of facts out on the table mm -hmm. that people get back and say, okay, I, I agree with that. 
you know, and even then, if you follow that up with, you know, advocates on both sides to say, mm -hmm. okay, given those facts, here's what I make of it. Because I think one of the issues that confounds the debate around hydraulic fracturing, as an example, or, you know, climate change, or more appropriately, what the right reaction, what, what the right kind of reaction to climate change is and so forth, is that all you ever see are selective bits of facts with spin, mm -hmm. and you, there's never sort of a, let's just kind of agree on a common set of facts, and we can argue about what we make out of it, as opposed to my facts are better than your facts. So I, I, mean, I think this could really, you know, this, 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 this concept could be really very, very powerful. Um, mm -hmm. You know, if you can just get, you know, a data set out in an unbiased way, and then let people argue over interpretation as mm -hmm. opposed to facts. So I, I know I, I was, I'm impressed with that. I wish I was staying tomorrow night because I would yeah. enjoy sitting through that because I might, don't feel like I've ever been told the straight be, story. They might be taping it. I can't remember that. I think they are. So you might be able to watch it if you're really that eager. Yeah. So you can, and you could send me an email. I can get you connected with that link or whatever. So, but thank you. Well, I feel very much like, like Jim, the idea of a non-advocacy zone uh, coming from Washington, D.C. is just <laughs> inconceivable. <laughs> and so, um, but what I'm curious about, I was reading your, your little bio here and I saw right. that you did a lot of work in things like moral norms right. and other issue framing, market-based policies. Right. So when you have something like this uh, meeting, do things like that get discussed? In other words, are things like moral norms brought into it? Because as soon as you're talking moral norms, you're not talking facts. So how does, uh -huh. how does that work? So that's a great question. And I will try to restrain myself and not take 20 minutes answering it. Okay. Let me just say, because, because right, you asked somebody about the research, suddenly so look out, it's trouble. But um, let me just say this. So, so here's Linda again, right? So, so at this event of, again, these are basically environmental regulators, right? These, these are not really social scientists. The talk that had people absolutely wrapped, right, was Linda's talk about, so why do farmers do what they do, right? And how do we get a farmer to maybe be a little more likely to consider a new way of managing his field, right? So people were just hanging on every word, right? Like this is the thing they really wanted to know because as my advisor used to say, you want to talk about hard science, right? Try to understand people, right? So, um, and so there's something to that. So one of the things Linda talked about, which is similar to my research, is that, you know, what people think is right is really important to what they end up doing, basically, right? And so, and that is a fact, right? Now, what's right isn't a fact, but what those farmers think is right about, like, this is the way a farmer should treat the land, right, or should not treat the land, right? Or, you know, I'm a leader in the farm community, right? So if I decide to adopt a new technique, then suddenly you might consider that much more seriously because you, you really respect what I'm doing. Those are facts, right? We can measure that as social scientists. So people who study things like moral norms or what have you, right, values and that kind of thing, right, on the one hand, they're getting into this world of stuff that's a little harder to measure, but you can definitely measure it, right? And if you want to understand why people do what they do, which is one way of describing social science, right, then people like me at least would argue you really have to look at that, right? You really have to attend to, even if you go back to another fancy word, so one of the fancy words we use, right, we talk about institutions. So we, some of us in political science and other disciplines would call these norms informal institutions, right? These unwritten rules of appropriate behavior. And there's some pretty good work that suggests that A, you can really study those and actually kind of measure them, right? And that B, if you want to really understand why people do what they do, you should start with those, right? The formal rules are actually remarkably irrelevant to most decision making, right? What's actually the law or the policy and so as somebody who teaches public policy, I love to sort of explain that to my students, that if I was gonna try to understand why you did what you did in the last five minutes, the law would be actually almost probably remarkably irrelevant, right, to many of those decisions. But all of these unwritten rules would be incredibly important. So anyway, I'm not sure if that answers your question, but, but that's, that's the way I would try to answer it. I think I'm actually out of time anyway, so okay, thank you. Nope, thanks again.